know, God is a little bit reckless, is he not? Yes. He can be reckless because even in his recklessness, he puts us back together. And today we're going to talk about that, Christ being our friend and what it means to have Christ as a friend and, and what to experience in that. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Hebrews chapter 5. I mean, chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. But right now, you know, God is moving in this room. If you don't sense his movement, you're not alive to anything. And God speaks into our lives, and, and he knows, you know, what we face. For he has said, you know, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Therefore, we can confidently say, I will trust in him. What can man do to me? And yet we face, we face a time when we don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. We don't know what the deal is about today. We don't know about tomorrow. And yet God says, through his son Christ Jesus, I am your friend. We face difficulties. We face defeat. Sometimes, you know, we've got these great, great victories. And, man, we're up there on the mountaintop and everything's pretty awesome. And then there's the agony of defeat. You remember the old ABC uh, sports guy skiing down uh, the, the skew do hickey majigger? I don't know what they call that because we're from Florida and don't have ski, ski do hickey majiggers. And, and, and that, that, uh, that skier goes off, and man, it's a big crash and all that kind of a stuff. And, and there's that agony of defeat. But yet God says we don't have to walk in fear. We don't have to, to be afraid because we can know that he is for us, that he never leaves us, that he never forsakes us, that he walks with us all the way. And, but even, you know, we, we may question, well, how can I look forward to the future, even this afternoon, with optimism? How can I have confidence? How can I know peace? How, how can I walk with joy? I mean, those are big things, right? And I think one of the things that hinders the church from, from grabbing a hold of all that God has for us is understanding who God is to us. We can have optimism and we can have confidence and we can have joy and we can have hope and we can know peace because God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you know what? There's uncertainty ahead of us, is there not? There's uncertainty even tomorrow night. We don't know who's going to win that ball game, Clemson or Alabama. See, we don't know. I mean, if we actually knew who was going to win the ball game, why well, have the ball game, right? That'd take the fun out of it. There's uncertainty. We, we face times, you know, with uh, not only the uncertainty that, that lies in front of us, but the perplexity of it. Man, I'm not only uncertain about this, but this is perplex. This is difficult. And we'll, and we'll deal both with defeat and with victory. But the thing that remains the same over and over and over again is this, is God never forsakes us. He never leaves us. He says, I will be your friend today, tomorrow, yes, and forever. And, and this is something I know. I've come to recognize through years of pastoral ministry in the church is everybody is going to leave the church. Did y'all know that? Everybody's going to leave the church. Some people, they're going to get upset. They didn't like the way the cookies were burnt. And they burn the cookies every week. Well, they do that for me because I love burnt cookies. Or I'm, I'm not really saying anybody's ever complained about the cookies, but you know how people complain about things, right? They'll, they'll leave upset. Or suddenly God will move in their life and, and they're, they're, they're suddenly moved on to, to a greater and more meaningful ministry somewhere. Or they'll die and go to heaven or go to hell. Or, you know, they'll just drift away, but everybody's going to leave. And get this, think about this. How many of you have had a lot of friends in your life? 
Only two, three, four? <laughs> Come on. How many of you really, you, you count them all up. You've had a lot of friends. You can put up both hands, right? How many of you would say those friends are still tight and close with you today out of all those people? You see what? Friends don't remain either. You know, the Bible says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But God says, I am your friend. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. When, when things are uncertain, when things are perplexed, when you face defeat, when you live in victory, he says, I'm there. And, and here's what we need to learn. Because God is there, whether it's defeat or victory, whether it's uh, difficult or perplexed or whatever else it may be, is we have to learn contentment. Ooh, that's a big one, to be content. How can I have a content life? Because, you know, I want what I want when I want it, and I want what I want right now, right? We're, we're not very content. You know, we, we get a new car, and, and we're proud of that new car, and suddenly the new model year comes up, and they've completely changed that thing out. What happens? We get a little discontent. I don't see any of y'all driving 1960s model cars around here. I mean, they do in Cuba. Right? But we're not seeing that around here unless it's the auto club, you know, where they've restored one. Because we, we grow a little bit discontent. And, and, and double knit. I mean, you know, discontentment. Remember when double knit was all the, the rage? Some of you guys had double knit Leisure suits? How many of you dare wear one of those today? Because we, you know, we're, we're not really a content, content kind of people. But, but here the writer of the Hebrews tells us in verse 5 to be content with what you have. And we as people, we deal with, with covetousness. Man, I, 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 I see what you've got and I want it. I mean, we see that with little kids. You put them in a room and they're, you know, they're going to they're go back and forth. My kids decided I needed a dog for Christmas. So they gave me a 13-week-old beagle. You think that's funny, Bill? <laughs> so, you know, I've got, the, I've got the, the, the beagle. His name is Moses. But I got a granddaughter that comes this week named Nene. And they fight over... The stuffed animal. I mean, if one has one, they're going, they all want that one. You know, you know how dogs are, and kids are, and adults are. I mean, we, we covet. We want and we want. And, and, you know, the result of all this covetousness and, and greed and, and discontent and, and, and frustration is, is we have a dissatisfaction, we have a disillusionment, and we have discontent. And it's not just your problem and my problem. It's not just a church problem. It's not just a problem in Destin or Florida or the United States. It's a worldwide problem. Worldwide, people are disillusioned. Worldwide, people are discontent. Worldwide, people are not satisfied. And, 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 and so, you know, when we live in that kind of a world, how do we overcome that kind of, a stu that kind of stuff? Well, we have to come to know the source of contentment. God says, be content with what you have. For he says, said, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. You know, God has made everything, everything in this world available for us to enjoy. In the book of Romans, he tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, uh, um, not also with him graciously give us all things? You know, God's given us everything to enjoy. We go a little bit further in the New Testament, and we find in, in 1 Timothy uh, that they set their hopes on God, who richly provides us everything to enjoy. Now, now, I find that in the Bible, when the plain sense makes common sense, I need no other sense at all. I don't have to go and consult a thousand commentaries to understand what everything is. Do you understand what everything is? He's given us everything to enjoy. In the Corinthians, he says, whether present or in the future, all are yours, and you're Christ, and Christ is God. In other th words, everything that's in God is in Christ, and everything that is in Christ is for me. Everything that's in God is in Christ, and everything uh, that's in Christ is for me. 
Christ came and gave his life that I might have life, that I might know the power of his might, that I might know that every shadow that he will light up, every mountain he will climb up coming after me. And the psalmist said it so well when he penned Psalm 23. He said, this is what I've learned. I've learned the source of my contentment. It is God. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. But not only is there that source of contentment, we have to learn to walk with the spirit of contentment as well. I can sit here and say, yeah, I know all this. You know, it's kind of like when you're going through an issue and you've got all these friends in church. And what they're doing is they're quoting to you Bible verses. And, And maybe you're not wanting to hear Bible verses. Maybe you already know those Bible verses. Maybe you're saying under your breath, just shut up. Right? Well, we, we, we can know, you know, the, the, the source of that contentment, but we've got to have a spirit of that contentment as well. Does that make sense? It's not just a head thing, it's a spiritual thing. And the Scripture says if we have food and clothing with these, we, we're to be content. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So I learned to, to be content. I'm walking in a, with a, a spirit of content, uh, contentedness. And, and the problem is, is it's so easy for me to fall into temptation. Do you find that? Is it easy for you to fall into temptation? Hello, come on, let's, let's be real. You know, it doesn't matter if you started a new diet the other day because it's the new year, you've already fallen. How many of you have already fallen? Right. You know, temptation comes. And, and, and the end is destruction. I mean, we live in a world, as I've said, it's full of greed and jealousy, strife and frustration. Because of a deep-seated covetousness within us, it brings disillusionment, discontent, and dissatisfaction. But as those of us who follow after Jesus Christ, who Christ lives within us, the Bible tells us we're to be content. Now, Paul had something to say about that when he wrote to the, to the Philippians. He said about con- being content. Now, notice this word he uses. He says, I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. I have discovered the secret of how to abound, how to live being degraded, how to be full, and how to be empty. He said, I've learned. You know, I don't, just because I've trusted Christ, and I know God is the source of my contentment, I have to learn how to be content. I mean, I've known Christians down through the years who have not known what it is to be content. You ask them how they're doing, they go, well, I'm pretty good under the circumstances. Well, what are you doing under the circumstances? If God's given us everything to enjoy... How do I walk with God in such a way as to enjoy Him? And, and, and you say, well, well, don't you know Christ? Yeah, I've got His joy in my heart. Well, tell your face. <laughs> and let's get alive in the Lord. And, and Paul said, because I've learned this, it didn't come automatically. You think the first time he went to a Roman prison as a Roman citizen, man, this is luxury. No, he had to learn it. And because he had learned these things, he said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul said, you know, I've learned how to have plenty. I've learned how to be hungry. And this is what I find in in knowing the source of my contentment and the spirit of my contentment. God meets my, my need physically. In Psalm 37, David said, I've been young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, exhorts us, he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. If we'll focus on the Lord, he, he meets us along the way. It's a spiritual uh, me, uh, filling. Jesus said in that Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, there can be no personal contentment without a spiritual contentment. There is a God-shaped void in every one of us that only God can fill. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus speaks this verse, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you know what this tells us? That God is both our hunger and our satisfaction. Doesn't that sound cool? That God is our hunger and He's our satisfaction. He's our hunger. He's what, what we want. He's what we desire. He's what we go after. And He is our satisfaction. And He meets us vocationally. Paul said, for me to live as Christ, die as gain. For Paul, all of his life, even in a Roman prison, became a fulfilled life. And, you know, we, we talk about things that need to be fulfilled. You know, there are sinkholes all over America that need something underneath them, right? You've, you've heard the story of the sinkholes. Uh, they swallow up neighborhoods and, uh, or the houses or a Corvette museum in Kentucky. I mean, whoever knew Kentucky had sinkholes? I didn't know that. Sinkholes. And, and when people would build these buildings on top of the sinkholes, they didn't know that there's nothing underneath them to support them. And I think about the things that people build their lives upon today. It's like they build their lives upon that ground that, is, uh, that, that has a sinkhole underneath it. And when the pressure comes, it collapses. The songwriter said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. You know, I, I don't even trust my mama this much, he's saying. I don't trust my dad, my brother, my sister, my friend, my church people. I don't trust that. But I wholly lean on Jesus' name, for it's on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness tends to hide his face, there's no shadow. He won't light up, the Bible tells us. And his oath, his covenant, is his blood. They support me when the flood comes. And when all around our soul, our life gives way, Jesus Christ is our hope and stay because of this. Not only do we need to have a life that's content, we need that friend for life, and that's who Jesus is. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I will be your personal friend. The actual Greek uh, rendering of this text is, He Himself. It's not like me saying, well, I heard Jesus say this. That's not, that's not what's coming across. The actual rendering of the text is this. He himself has said, I will never leave you. No, never will I forsake you. He comes to dwell with us. You know, it would be awesome to know that God would send an angel to us in our life this year, wouldn't it? That angel would walk before us on every road. That that angel would be beside us through, through every scary spot. Driving through the Blackwater State Forest the other day with the rain coming down and going down into a couple of low spots and the trees growing across. My granddaughter was in there in the car, truck with me. And, you know, it looked a little dark, a little scary, all that rain coming down. And I said, ooh. You know, when those times come in our life, wouldn't it, know that, wouldn't it be awesome to know that Gabriel, the archangel, is there by our side? Woo! Wouldn't that be great? But God didn't send an angel. He himself has said. He himself, Jesus Christ himself has come to walk with us, to talk with us, to live with us, to live in us, to encourage us, to protect us, to provide for us, to be there through every stormy gale. And we are assured of the personal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ for every step of the way. In the Old Testament, there would be times that God would visit with guys like Moses and Joshua and David. In the New Testament, Christ would walk with men and women, but now he has come to indwell us. In the book of Galatians, Paul writes and says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that friendship is a never-ending friendship. It's not like our friends that we talked about a few moments ago. I mean, you know, we got gobs of friends in our lives. I mean, look, how many of you know all your friends on Facebook? Woo! You don't. 
And then I, I get some of these really weird friend requests. Right? Not that I'm talking about any of y'all, but, <laughs> but really. But Christ is a never-ending friend. I will never, no never, never leave you, nor never forsake you. He himself has said. And no matter how dark the night, we are assured of his personal presence. And because I've learned that contentment, and because I, I have a friend, you know what that gives me when I go through those deep valleys? The rain's coming down, and it's dark, and it's... Ooh, it gives me courage for life. In Hebrews 13, 6, because God said, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you, our response, as Matt pointed out, is we declare, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Contentment and friendship and courage. Those three things, if we can grab a hold of them and walk with them, will guide us through every day of this year that lies before us. He gives us the courage, first of all, to face the unknowns of life. You know, we, we all face days ahead, and there's that fear of the unknown, man. There's all kinds of unknown stuff, right? The unknown. Now think about Jacob in the Old Testament, book of Genesis. Jacob, you know, he, uh, he stole the birthright from his brother, Esau. Esau was a hunter. Jacob, Jacob hung out at the house with his mom. Jacob got to thinking after he stole that birthright, his brother's going to come put some whoop on him. And he takes off and he runs for his life. And, and he runs and he runs and, and night falls and, and he lies down beside a little creek and he takes a, a stone to be a pillow. And he goes to sleep and it was then that God gave him a vision of a ladder that stretches into heaven. And the divine purpose of his life was revealed to him. And God said in Genesis 28, Behold, I am with you and will keep you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back uh, to this land. For I will not leave you. You see, when the Hebrew writer wrote those words, those weren't new words. God said, I'll never leave you until I've done what I promised you. And when Moses gave his final message to the children of Israel, he set before them death and life, and he told them whatever opposition they had faced in Canaan, that they could be assured of the presence of God. In Deuteronomy 31, he said, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Wow, you know, we all have unknowns in life, don't we? We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what's going to be here this afternoon, tomorrow, or next week. And you know what? He gives us the courage to face responsibilities. We know our responsibilities, do we not? You know, we know what's on our shoulder. We know what's on our plate. We know how, what we're responsible for, what we're supposed to make happen. And with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can face the unknowns in life and we can face the responsibilities in life. Joshua was a, was a young man that was given the responsibility of leadership. You know, God spoke to Joshua and said, my, Moses, my servant's dead. I mean, Moses, the, one of the greatest leaders of all time. Think about it. One of the greatest leaders of all time. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land I'm giving them to the people of Israel. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Think of the responsibilities that, that Joshua had to carry. I mean, leadership. How do you rise to fill the shoes of Moses? And administration over all those millions of folks. How do you administrate that? And, and, and think about this. The incompatibilities of personalities. I mean, you've never seen that in a church, have you? And grumbling people. Definitely never seen that in a church. Think about all the things that, that he was responsible for. And yet God says, go forward with courage. 
And here David was, a man after God's own heart, but he'd been a man of battle and a man of blood and could not build the temple. So he turns that responsibility over to his son Solomon. And he says to, to Solomon, be strong and be courageous and do it. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. I mean, there's a lot of things that you're going to face in the days that come that make you fear, that make you tremble, that make you want to back away. And God says, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He'll not leave you, he'll not forsake you until the work for service of the house of the Lord is finished. Whatever God's plan is in your life, he's not done with you. Did you know that? How many of you in this room are over 70 years of age? That's a bunch of you. Do you think God's done with you? I hope not, because you're still breathing. I mean, if God's done with you and you're still breathing, you're taking up space, you're taking up a good seat, right? God's not done with you. You've got gifts, you've got abilities, you've got talents, you've got personality. You've got all this stuff. Some of you may be snowbirds. Well, so what? God can still use you right here. We need greeters. We need workers with Awana. We need uh, workers in, in, in all areas of our church. You can join in and be a part of that. God's not done. You think, man, I've screwed my life up so bad, there's no way God can use my life. It's, it's just a flop. God specializes in raising towers out of flops. And he can do something in your life. You see, we need the courage that comes through knowing the presence of the Lord Jesus. Did you know that we can know the presence of God in our lives? Moses, I mean, one of the world's greatest leaders, God said, I want you to lead my children Israel. And here he is, he's gone up on the mountain, he's gotten the Ten Commandments, he comes down, he sees them acting up, he gets kind of bent out of shape, y'all remember that? Maybe you didn't grow up in church, you don't remember that, but he has these Ten Commandments on, on st ta stones of tablet, tablets of stone. He just throws them down and breaks them. He blows them off. He says, you folks aren't worth the cuss. God sends him back up on the mountain. He receives it again. He says, God, how am I going to do this? God says in my presence, he says, how am I going to know your presence? He said, Moses, come here. Moses, I want you to stand in the cleft of this rock. I want you to stand on this rock, and I'm going to put my hand upon you. And when my presence passes by, you're not going to die because I'm going to shield you, but you're going to stand in my presence. Remember when he came down off the mountain? Maybe you don't remember but he came down off the mountain. Man, his face was lit up. You're talking about somebody that looked like they had laid out on the beach in the middle of July with baby oil on for three days straight. He looked like it. He was lit. But he had stood in the presence of God. Today, that rock is none other than Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And Jesus is that rock. And standing on that rock means that you're placing your personal faith in Him. And I'm not talking about a religion of faith. You know, there's a lot of people that have a, a, a religion of faith in which, I mean, they, they obviously don't have any reality or something going on. I'm talking about a relationship where, where we say to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not a formal prayer. It's not a matter of walking an aisle and coming and shaking the preacher's hand and sitting on the front row and getting introduced to the church and having a few drops of water sprinkled on us and all that kind of stuff. It's about walking in a relationship where we ourselves have declared to Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are Emmanuel, God with us, that you came from heaven to earth. You came to Bethlehem as a baby. You walked upon the earth. You went to the cross. You went to the grave. You rose again. And I believe that you are the Son of God, and I invite you into my life. I give up control. I turn it over to you. I trust you completely.
And that is how we walk with confidence and with friendship and with courage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning you've given to us. We thank you for the blessing of your presence. We thank you for that moment in which your spirit poured out in this room and you grabbed our attention. And Lord, we pray that in this moment of decision that we would look confidently unto you and declare, I trust you, Jesus. To you be the glory, both now and throughout all of eternity. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.